am so excited to welcome you, Stephen Backhouse. We are having conversations about what is worship. So all of this business of lockdown and not gathering, not maybe singing together, has prompted many of us to go take a step back and go, what even is worship? So I am inviting some people with a variety of perspectives and areas of study and expertise. Um, some people that are mainly practitioners, we're gonna have some interesting conversations over the coming weeks. But today I'm really excited, like really, really excited about having Stephen Backhouse with us. Stephen, would you start just by telling us a little bit about yourself? Because well, I don't really know you. <laughs> Know, that, right? I, I'm just meeting you for the first time now yeah. and we have a lot of mutual friends I think I think mm -hmm. you and I both love some similar people which is we great do. We um, do. I am Canadian and I have been living in England now for 25 years um, I originally grew up in Western Canada so Bible Belt evangelical I grew up born again that's my shorthand and I, when I was 19, I moved to England for an adventure. And I, uh, long story short, I married an English girl and I've stayed here since for 25 years. So that's kind of my odd accent. That explains that. And uh, I am, I did my doctorate on nationalism and theology. So I am, uh, my area of interest is uh, in Christian nationalism and in patriotism and in Christian attitudes towards allegiance, national identity of the state and that kind of thing. And a lot of my work is done through, well, I use the New Testament a lot, almost exclusively now, but I began life by studying Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, who was also critical of patriotism and nationalism mm -hmm. for deep Christ-centered reasons. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wrote a biography of him a few years ago as well, which oh, did so you? I kind of have two hats, which people don't know are the same hat. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a biographer and a philosopher, but I'm also a, a theological uh, assessor of nationalism. That is so, so exciting. I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you about your areas of interest and um, I had a professor in un university who was a very keen Kierkegaard oh, um, lover so, so I've I've read a little bit um, it's been a long yes. time he's called Cliff Williams okay he's written a few books as well I had to do a philosophy class the other thing we have in common is that we both have funny accents so hopefully our viewers and listeners will be okay with our unusual where, where, accents. Where, we've just met so where's your accent from my right? accent is so i was born in the states okay. and then i was raised in austria my parents were missionaries okay and still are actually and now i've lived in northern ireland for 20 years so we have a lot in common then. <laughs> we do. I know this is very exciting. So um, I'm always encouraged to meet someone whose story is a little bit complex and it takes a while to figure out where on earth they're from. Um, so anyway, we're so glad that you've taken some time out to talk to us. And the, the way that I um, found you was that one of our mutual friends recommended some of your teachings. So I'm coming into this conversation having listened to about eight of your teachings. And this is from the podcast, the 10th yes, Theology podcast. Yes, yeah. the 10th Theology, which if you are watching this, you should definitely check those out. Um, I was wondering, in order to set up this conversation, is there a way that you could give us a, a, a bit of a summary on eight talks? <laughs> so that there's a context for this question of what is worship is that possible can you can you give us a little bit of a, a preamble and then talk to us about what is worship well i guess that i would say i mean a lot of times christians have a really strong muscle memory or a, a reaction that they say well the gospel isn't political or jesus wasn't political or they think that you know being a that worship has nothing to do with politics we just leave politics at the door and uh i'm just very keenly aware that 
Well, let's go straight to the headline. Patriotism is worship. Nationalism is worship of your country. And the headline, we can fill it in later, but I think patriotism and nationalism aren't actually that different. And that what you're doing is you are worshiping, you are giving your country, your home national and ethnic structure that you're born into, that was created by humans, you are giving that the, your identity, you are giving it your ultimate allegiance. Mm -hmm. You think that your life, when it really comes down to it, you think that your life has purpose when you die for that country or when you kill for it. Mm -hmm. And that uh, also, you know, when it comes to, the, for example, the Sermon on the Mount or, or any of the, the way that Jesus said or did, that basically what happens is the moment that that trying to follow the way of Jesus um, interrupts your ability to make your country the best country it can be, Christians all over the world throw Jesus over at the first hurdle because you can't run a country according to the Sermon on the Mount. And so all I see is that, the, and I'm part of a school of thought which sees that, that nationalism or patriotism as a rival religion to following Jesus. And it isn't just this innocent, neutral thing. It's actually a rival faith. <laughs> it's a rival set of meaning. It's a rival set of actions. We have our own liturgies. We have our own songs that we sing to our nations. We have our own sacred language and sacred symbols. It's a rival religion. And so I don't think it's neutral. And I think that it is a, a form of worship. So to me, politics and worship are very interconnected. And, um, and, I, and I don't think that you can just say Jesus is, uh, has no opinion on politics or on the forms of life that we how we organize our power and how we organize ourselves. I think those things are very interconnected because really when it comes down to it, the, the earliest Christians, the people who knew Jesus, <laughs> right? The people who wrote the New Testament, they didn't think they were starting a new uh, form of theology or a new religion. They thought they were starting a new kingdom. And they thought of Jesus as their king. And they thought of the kingdom of heaven as an actual viable form of life in the here and now, mm -hmm. which involved how they thought about their ethnicity, which, by the way, they didn't think it was that important. How, what they thought about setting up borders between foreigners, they didn't think that was very important. Uh, how they thought they should spend their resources on each other. By the way, they thought they should spend their resources open-handedly and freely. They thought the kingdom of heaven had rules about how you treated your enemies. You don't kill them. You love them. You don't use lethal violence to protect what's rightfully yours. The kinds of things that the earliest Christians thought they were doing when they were living in the kingdom of heaven are overtly and directly political. <laughs> And they overtly and directly run against almost any of the common sense laws and customs of any nation that you or I are a part of. That is so challenging and well done for basically summarizing eight talks in a few minutes. So um, let's do a little detour and then we'll come back to the question of what is worship? Because um, I think we'll probably have a few follow up questions and we'll spend yeah. a little bit of time there. Um, this this is this is an interesting time for you to be having these <laughs> opinions. Well, it's funny when I when I did my doctorate, like this is about fifteen years ago. I was doing um, nationalism and Christianity, and people would kind of go, "Oh, that's not relevant anymore, is it?" You know, those who cares now? You know, now it's twenty twenty, and like nationalism and Christianity are running the world. You know, self professed nationalists mm -hmm. are all are the ones that. Uh, attracting the most gleeful enthusiasm from self-professed Christians all over the world. So I felt when I heard you speaking, I thought you are an important voice for this moment. <laughs> and, um, and yet it must not be easy to say the things that you say. And, 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 I, and I've listened to you long enough now that I can hear your heart and your you're 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 very kind in how you present things um however <laughs> the 
this is really difficult. So how do you manage that? We were talking about this a little bit before we hit record, that this is a really difficult subject and people get really upset. Well, when you deal with, I mean, we, there's probably a longer talk that we could go into later about what a principality is or a power in principality. But, you know, a power in a principality, a principality goes wrong when it acts like a little god. So it's like a, a human or an institution or, a, or an unseen force, which then acts as if it had no creation and it has no, all, you know, no purpose. Mm. It acts like a god. And principalities hate it when you tell them they're not little gods. When you tell them to put them back in their box. When Jesus said humans were, Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath, he was putting a principality back in its box. He wasn't saying Sabbath was bad. He was saying it has a purpose. It was created for a reason and it was created to serve humans. But of course, what the Sabbath hears is you hate us, you're against us, and it fights back. And uh, similarly, when you say countries, your home nations serve a purpose, they are limited in their purpose, they don't deserve your love, your ultimate allegiance, mm -hmm. their nations fight back because because you're telling them they're not a little god and they they don't like that you are committing sac sacrilege and blasphemy against them so mm -hmm. um so yeah you do feel a, a pushback you can never you know when i'm a traveling speaker and teacher and the easiest way to make a christian spitting mad at you is to tell them they should love their enemies i can see it all the time like the one thing you can do to get christians mad is to suggest that they shouldn't kill their enemies mm -hmm. in a nationalist context. Mm -hmm. Just instantly, just rage. And when you see that, you're like, oh wow, we're in a we're in a realm here of like, if you if you are a kind of Christian and you don't believe in demonic manifestations, just go into a room of patriotic Christians and tell them that patriotism is a vice. Mm -hmm. And you'll see some demonic manifestations. Mm -hmm. Um, I've you face it you face really angry rage even though I'm not hating anyone I'm not hating look I don't hate America I don't hate Canada I don't hate the UK I don't want to destroy it I just don't want to kill human beings for its for it and yet that will bring out ultimate rage in people mm. and um, you know I, even even uh, I've started this little podcast series, you know, and it's not, I'm not filled with slander and anger against people, but no, it's not. But, um, you know, I, I just this weekend, I had a real kind of anxiety because once you start to go public, you know, if you stick your head above the parapet, mm. um, you get sniped at. Um, I always find it funny that like evangelicals and charismatics are very keen to point out like, how cancel culture, you know, oh, your left-wing liberals, they're all about cancel culture and the PC wars. It's like, wow, evangelicals perfected cancel culture a long time ago. Like, there is a whole battlefield just filled with the bodies of Christians who, with good will and a good heart, tried to go against some mm -hmm. of the gods worshipped by evangelicals, and they get sniped at and killed and canceled so quickly. And I had a bit of anxiety about that this weekend. I kind of had almost like a panic attack. Oh, did you? Where I could see some, I could see some uh, emails waiting for me in my inbox. Mm. And I was like, you know, I didn't even really know it was in them. I was like, oh, I've gone public now. And I, now people are going to be sniping back at me and fighting me. And, mm. and I just had this kind of weird panic a attack about it or anxiety about a dread of having to open and deal with these questions. And, you know, in the end, they weren't that bad, actually, but it was just more the expectation of it, the dread mm -hmm. of like, you're waiting for the hammer to fall when you start to speak mm -hmm. against patriotism, actually, you kind of wait for the, the enemies to come because they do. I've seen it happen. I'd be a fool not to think that. Mm. But anyway. <laughs> but so thank you. We appreciate you sharing your thoughts again publicly. And we are speaking mainly to vineyard worship leaders, maybe some vineyard pastors. But I used to be, my wife and I were, were really happy uh, members of the vineyard church in Oxford. Oh, when really? You, yeah, when when oh. we were doing our degrees, uh, Vineyard Oxford was our 
was our home church. Yeah. Oh, excellent. That's great. I didn't know we had that common link as well. Yeah. That's brilliant. So I think mainly our listenership are in the vineyard, but there will be others that tune in. And if you're not from a vineyard and you're listening and you're really welcome. Um, but we appreciate you speaking out and sharing your thoughts with us today. So back to this question of worship. What, what is worship? You've, you've touched a little bit on this piece of, is worship political? Mm. That's a brave place to go, even that question alone. So. Well, I think everything is political. I mean, if you, I would just l challenge any Christian to, to describe the gospel without using words like king, Jew, Gentile, Roman, uh, Greek, Samaritan. I'd like them to talk about the gospel without talking about enemies, neighbors, um, you know, like the, the, the kind of socio-political taxes, Caesar, you know, how can you talk about uh, anything that Jesus said or did without talking about foreigners and mm -hmm. children and women and elites and poor, like just so many social categories, which basically are just political. And he might not have been part of a party. It wasn't political party. We're not talking partisan politics when we talk about politics. We just mean how we organize our lives, how we spend our resources, who we think it's valuable to spend resources on. Are we grouping together with people who look like us and sound like us as much as possible? You know, all these kind of things that humans do, that's political. And Jesus had something to say overtly and directly about all of those things so so um there was a theologian named augustine who wrote a, a, a really important book called the city of god and he's uh, this was back in the 400s right <laughs> and and he wrote the city of god partly because he was talking about so rome by this stage rome had become a, a christianized empire Mm -hmm. Roman Empire was was largely Christianized, but it had now been attacked by barbarians coming in from the outside, from Germany, actually. And this caused a huge crisis of faith. So amongst the pagans who were still around, they said, ah, oh, this is because Rome has become Christian. That's why we've been, the barbarians have taken over. And of course, amongst the Christians, they also were having a crisis of faith because they were like, but we're Christian now. How could the barbarians invade? What's happened? And both sides very closely allied their, their uh, worship of God with their uh, nationalism. You know, the success of their nation was being tied to the, to the God they worship. And Augustine was very interesting because he didn't really start with talking about that. What he started was talking about justice. And he said, look, Rome fell because it was a fundamentally unjust society. It was doomed to fall. Because justice is where everyone gets what is, what is owed to them. So if, if everyone gets what is owed to them, then you have now reached a state of justice. But one of the things is that God is always one of the players in any of these equations. And if you have a, a human system in which God isn't getting what's owed to him, you are living in a fundamental state of injustice. What is owed to God? worship so if you are living in a society which isn't giving god worship it's a fundamentally unjust society how do you worship god well so if everyone has to get what's rightfully owed to them how do you determine what's rightfully owed to god mm. well you have to worship the true god how do you worship the true god does he look like jesus if you are, you know, Jesus is the incarnation. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the word of God. He is the voice of God. Jesus is what God looks like. So if you aren't worshiping Jesus, you are living in a state of fundamental injustice because you're not giving God what is due to him. And to worship Jesus means <laughs> to do as he says, to act as he does, to go and do likewise. The least of these, you know, who are the least? You have cold water to the least of these. Do you go to visit the prisoners? You know, Jesus makes it very clear what worship of him looks like. So, you know, the, the right running of a human organization and the, 
the worship of Jesus are connected. I don't know if this makes sense, but it does. Yeah, Augustine thought that justice and worship were connected because mm -hmm. they are what you're giving God is His due to Him. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you give something more than it's due to them, you're not giving them what they're owed either. And so you look at this sort of human societies that we build. And we might use God language. We might talk about God, God save the queen or in God we trust or God bless America or whatever. But is that word G-O-D, is the God that you are worshiping, is that the truth? Is that Jesus Christ? Is that the image of the invisible God? Or is it perhaps a projection of power? Is it just your image of what a, a bully looks like or what a power in the universe looks like, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, you're not actually, just using God language isn't the same as worshiping the true God at all. In fact, using God language, for a lot of Christians, they look at their government or their politicians who just use the word God all the time, and they think, oh, well, that's the end of the story. Great, they're Christian. But I look at that and go, that's the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. I'm a, I, I think it's really important what kind of language we use and who we worship. And just some politician using God language makes me instantly want to think, well, what God are you talking, what God are you worshiping? And how are you doing it? And are you, are you following the way of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Or are you worshiping just your own power writ large on the universe? Which is a, an Augustine type point to make. He said, Rome is just worshiping itself. And it's doomed to fall. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> that was a lot. So in the context of this conversation is this question of whether we should or shouldn't sing. Some places are, um, it's very clear from the government to avoid singing. Other places, for instance, where I live, yeah, we can sing if we wish. Um, and some um, conversations around what is our worship if we can't sing anymore have started, which have been really great conversations actually, but what do you see? Where does singing fit into worship? Well, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Like in, at the end of Matthew, like Jesus very specifically, there's a, there's a whole section there where Jesus very specifically says, the people who shout my name loudly <laughs> and who do signs and wonders, that's not what worship is, you know? And then he, he reframes it and he says, well, did you, like I said, did you visit the prisoner? Did you give a cup of cold water to people in need? That's what worship looks like. So, you know, this whole idea that we just think that worship is the same as singing is, is a problem. It really is a problem because worship doesn't just look like singing. Um, and I, th I think everybody knows that, but mm -hmm. I think nobody would argue with me if I said that, but do we practice that? Mm -hmm. Do we think, oh, I can't sing in public, therefore I can't worship. This is an attack on worship. It's like, it's not an attack on worship. Um, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. So wearing a face mask because you're the elderly person in your congregation asks you to, that's an act of worship for example, like not joining together in a large congregation where you're all belting out stuff and spewing the virus through your vocal cords. That's an act of worship mm -hmm. to not sing <laughs> because you're, you're, you're caring for the least, for the most vulnerable person amongst you, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. So I would make an argument that not singing is an act of worship and projecting your, if you are like, I'm not going to let my freedoms be infringed upon or something. Well, that's the ultimate projection of yourself into the universe at the expense of anybody else, which is the opposite of worship. You're not giving God his due. I don't understand how anybody who, who, who uses the language of Jesus, you can't say, Lord, Lord, and then turn around and not lay down your life for your friend, not withdraw yourself to make space for other selves. That is the whole point. That's what Jesus does, yeah. Philippians 2 and elsewhere. So to me, yeah, Steve, I don't we love singing. worship and singing. I, I associate singing as the act of worship is, is speaking truth back to God. You're speaking God's truth back to him. 
you are joining with others to offer the best you can. Like I love, I love singing <laughs> as an act of worship. I do, but I don't think singing and worship are the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's the thing. We love it, especially us worship leaders. We, we love it. We mm -hmm. love singing. Yeah. And so this is challenging what we love and why we love it, how much we love it. Is it making you, I mean, is this pause button that the universe seems to have pressed on us and made us all stop what we're doing? Has that made you think differently about how uh, you lead other people in worship? Me personally? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it's made me think differently, but I definitely see that this is an opportunity mm -hmm. to actually act upon the things that I have been thinking about and sensing. Mm -hmm. for some time as i've observed where worship in the western world anyway is gone mm -hmm. the emphasis on production the emphasis on singing and i think we see lots of singing in the bible and singing is good and corporate singing is yeah. powerful yeah. and some of my most uh, my most treasured encounters with the lord have been in times where there yeah. have been lots of people singing however yeah. it's i've realized how much of that is about me <laughs> And what I like. Yes. And what I mean, I'm comfortable with. What feels good to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's deeply human. But, but that's okay. So was Jesus. <laughs> like the incarnation is deeply human too. So it's a bit like, I remember once somebody, some sort of, you know, oh, you're not, you're not really worshipping God. You're just the the serotonin you know receptors in your brain are being activated or something yeah, like, yeah. well yeah but that's i'm a human that's how it works like that's like saying to somebody uh you didn't really hear your wife say that she loves you all you all that happened was some some noises vibrated the bones in your inner ear hmm. and i'm like no that's how i heard her say i love you that's that just explains <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean that it didn't happen and that's what i feel like with singing is like it's brilliant i'm not trying to deconstruct singing but the reason it's brilliant is because when humans get together to do something together as best they can that's an act of worship mm -hmm. right? it's an act of them doing the best they can um so you know what if we have you experimented much with with mourning or lament you know where the absence of the thing helps you to appreciate it more well this is one of the other conversations that people are having now we are having some of the most profound conversations in this season it is such an opportunity i would hate to miss it um, my husband recently said in this conversation of how quickly do we dial everything and reconstruct everything are we in a big push just to to rebuild something that the Lord has taken down or pushed mm -hmm. pause on. And so I guess for us, we're just trying to go slowly in the process of rebuilding and um, take our time with that as a community, even though in Northern Ireland, we could go quickly, we could be singing in our gatherings already. Um, I think it's an incredible opportunity. <laughs> this is kind of where the politics comes in again. I mean, you notice how, look, I'm, I'm aware here that the vineyard has had its own conversations about this. So I'm going to be sensitive here, but I mean, notice how, notice how quickly people go to politics when, when this kind of stuff comes up, like yep. my rights are being infringed. Absolutely. And this is an attack on our freedom and mm -hmm. it does go straight to politics. It's not me. I don't have to work hard to make a link between worship and politics because the people are making it themselves instantly. They're instantly going to there. And, um, and the idea that uh, we have a right to sing in public, whatever. Again, I find that very interesting. Look at what the New Testament, what its imagination is towards your own rights. Mm -hmm. And time and again, Jesus, Jesus's whole thrust is give up what is rightfully yours, even when it's rightfully yours. That's what the whole, th that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. That's what Turn the Other Cheek is about. That's what Go the Extra Mile is about. That's what when somebody sues you for a cloak, give them your coat as well. Jesus is constantly saying, give, don't clutch tightly to what is rightfully yours, even when it's rightfully yours, mm -hmm. because that's the way we work in the kingdom. 
because we're not orphans, there's always more. You can give it away because you'll get more back. You know, it's that kind of attitude. Mm. Um, but what I often see now amongst self-professed Christians is they are clutching fiercely to what is rightfully theirs. And they're not, they're really good at identifying their rights. They're terrible at using Jesus to help them figure out what to do with their rights. Jesus is constantly saying, give it away. Don't clutch to it. So, you know, if the law of the land says you should all sit in a group and you can sing in a group now, and there's one person in my community that is uncomfortable with it, then I need to say, we're going to lay our rights aside mm. for the sake of the weaker brother, for the, for, the, for the weaker person. And that's fine. That's the way we do things, right? So I almost don't care what the law of the land says. I care what my, my people in my Jesus community say, right? This is such a helpful conversation. <laughs> so, so let's say that we are re-entering the world of singing. Yeah. Could you, could you give us some input on what we're singing? What do we need more or less of in our songbook? Um, there is, okay, here's a couple of interesting Thing. So I was so there was a guy named Karl Barth who was a theologian who was he was uh, Austrian but he was living in Germany during the time of the Nazis and he was actually kicked out of the country because he wouldn't support Hitler and uh, he wrote a really interesting little he wrote many many things but Barth wrote a book called The Dogmatics and Outline which is a thin little volume and in it there's a it's like he gives an overview of his whole theology in about a hundred pages. And there's one chapter there. It's only about four pages long. It's, it's called God the Almighty. And in it, he says, when you worship the Almighty as God, that's blasphemy. When you say God is Almighty, that's worship. So Almighty God is blasphemy. God is Almighty is truth. And the difference is, he says, Hitler worships the Almighty. Because what Hitler and the nationalists do, again, he went straight to politics. What the nationalists are doing is they're identifying the strongest, biggest, meanest dog in the fight, the biggest bully on the top of the hill, and they're saying, that's the Almighty, that's God. So they're defining God by who has the most power. Whereas Bart says, but if God is Jesus, <laughs> then God is almighty. So who is God? He's the one who laid down his life. He's the one who allowed you to kill him. He's the one who does not dominate, right? That's what almighty looks like. So we allow Jesus to, ident to define power. We don't allow power to define God. So when I read, oh. yeah. <laughs> so when I'm singing and, and sometimes you gotta watch out for the way that our imaginations go is that we worship God Almighty, God the Almighty, or power. We use a lot of power language. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. We use that kind of language. And I know, look, I'm not saying it's written by evil Nazis. I am not saying that. But I am saying it's a lot of our imagination has not been shaped by what Jesus said power looks like. It's been shaped by what our culture and our nations and our armies and our businessmen say mm -hmm. power looks like yeah and i think that's important so we're not worshiping god in spirit and in truth mm -hmm. i do think that's important so mm -hmm. you know i often say to my students or to my churches that i speak to i'm like stop using god language so much actually like practice taking god out of your vocabulary and start putting jesus christ in instead <laughs> Because, because what a lot of people, I mean, everybody has a view of what a God, of what God is. And mm -hmm. you go out into the street and you'll get a million different answers. Um, God is kind of a blank slate that you can hang a lot of things on, right? God yeah. is kind of, the word God is sort of a benign gas in the universe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, but Jesus Christ now, now you've got, now you've got a shape to a life. Now you've got words that you can find and see what he says. You know what Jesus Christ sounds like. Mm -hmm. so you also know what he doesn't sound like. Um, you know what he 
what it feels like to be around him. You have a pretty good idea how he treats women and foreigners and children and, you know, and enemies. And like, it's a lot harder to just uh, shape Jesus Christ into your own image. It's very easy to shape the word God into your own image. Mm -hmm. So I would say to worship leaders, maybe stop singing about God so much. <laughs> There's a good one-liner. We'll make sure we lead with that one. <laughs> I often say I'm not a Guardian. Mm. I'm a Christian. Mm. That is really, really interesting. So what you're saying is we need more songs where we sing to and about Jesus. Yeah, so celebrating, speaking God's truth back to God, celebrating the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what do you think that would do for our churches if we did that more? Wow. Well, the result of that starts to shape our imagination it's so much of this is about when i say imagination i don't mean like uh making up stuff i don't mean imaginary what i mean is when you talk about somebody's imagination or their social imagination it's like their framework for how they perceive and interpret the world and so somebody's social imagination everybody has one um they're not optional they're deeply human we all have a framework for for how we view the world how we imagine what we think is going on and mm -hmm. when you talk to yourself about yourself when the church when the vineyard church talks to itself about itself what does it think is going on that's your social imagination mm -hmm. so singing is is a huge way that we start to shape the way that we what we think is important in the world what we think is worth celebrating it's our measure of goodness so if jesus isn't your measure of goodness then what is right mm -hmm. and so we need to start celebrating self-giving love celebrate um sacrifice to death even death on a cross celebrate the weakest and the poorest i don't know mm -hmm. it's just the idea of like f helping to frame what we think is valuable mm -hmm. and um you know i look i'm not i and i'm not meaning this as a as a slight because i actually genuinely like this song um and I don't even know anything about the person who wrote it. So I'm, this is not a comment on that person. But think of the song, um, King of My Heart. You know, we sing to, to Jesus, King of My Heart. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but I mean, just notice the social imagination there of that. If you said to an early Christian, is Jesus King of your heart? They were like, what are you talking about? He wasn't sacrificed on a Roman cross, which is a, political torture instrument preserved for people seen to be enemies of Rome. He wasn't put on a cross because he was king of my heart. He was put on a cross because he was king of the world. <laughs> he was king of the Jews. He was seen as like making a new way of life that was destabilizing and challenging the other ways of life around him. So when you sing to Jesus, king of my heart, you are instantly helping to shape an imagination that thinks your relationship to Jesus is primarily inward and private. And it's not, Interesting. you know, and it wasn't to the, any of the earliest Christians. Can I give you a, do you have time? Can I give you a bit of Bible? Story? I have time. <laughs> so, Please so, keep going. Think of, okay. So here I've talked about this on my podcast, I think, or somewhere, but you know, when I was six years old, I grew up in this, conservative evangel like self-professed i'm not being mean you know they're self-professed conservative evangelicals a lot of people would have called themselves fundamentalists i grew up in this culture and i was six years old and i went to a, a, a worship meeting a prayer meeting and they they sang a song and they said oh how i love jesus so i'm a little six-year-old and i thought oh i don't love jesus so the words i'm saying are not what i believe so i need to do something about this so this is like Six-year-olds can have these thoughts, by the way, in case you're just <laughs> reminded. Six-year-olds can have existential crisis where they realize that the words they're saying are not what they believe. Mm. So I said, okay, I got to do something about this. So I prayed the prayer and I invited Jesus into my heart because that was the words that, that was the language and the social imagination I'd been told. And I wrote it in the front of my Bible and I still have that little Bible. And I wrote the date of when I invited Jesus into my heart. So I want you to hear me. I'm not mocking this, okay? It's important to me. But I guarantee you that in John 3, 
when Nicodemus, who is the, the, the Pharisee who has an elite social standing and he comes to Jesus because he's ashamed of what his fellows will think of him. He comes to Jesus at night and Jesus looks at Nicodemus and says, ah, Nicodemus, your, the solution to your problem is you need to be born again. I guarantee you, Nicodemus did not hear, you need to invite me into your heart and write your name and the date on the top of your Torah. <laughs> what Nicodemus heard was, you need to die to all of that social privilege and elite status and inherited ethnic traditions that you were born into. You need to die to those and you need to be publicly seen to be with me, be born into my family. That's what it meant. Mm. It was the exact opposite of a secret private act. Nicodemus was being invited to, to embrace downward social mobility, <laughs> mm. to be seen to be with Jesus. And, and, and in fact, he slinks away. We don't even know what happened to him at the end of that story. He shows up later at the end of John, but in John 3, he just disappears and we don't even know what happened to him. But, you know... I, and that's part of what I just think we've got to just keep doing that. Like following Jesus is not a private inward thing. It's personal, but it's not private. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what our songs need to start to reflect. I think that's where, that's where our songs can start to shape our uh, imagination of what we think we're doing when we worship Jesus or King Jesus. So just to really drive this point home, can you think of a worship song that you really like? I like All Hail King Jesus. Okay, tell us why. I don't, well, it's, it's uh, I feel like he's pouring the best of him into his music. I feel like it kind of feels like what it would feel like to see your liberator come, you know, like come in and break the siege. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't seem individualistic to me. It seems kind of public and big. Yeah. I like that. song. I, I think that would be, that's the first one that came to mind. That's good. That's he's good. He's a savior of the world. I mean, again, he's using, He's using language lifted straight from the New Testament there, by the way. So King of My Heart is not listed from the New Testament, but all hail King Jesus, Savior of the world. That is coming directly from when Jesus speaks to the Samaritan woman at the well, which, by the way, is, national, is, a, is a comment on nationalism when Jesus speaks to a Samaritan. And then this, she goes to her villagers and she brings them back. And she says, come meet this man. And then they proclaim, oh, he's Savior of the world right? That was the phrase that Emperor Nero took on for himself. And the Emperor Nero was the Emperor of Rome at the time when the Gospel of John was written down. And so John puts into the Samaritans' words the phrase that Nero had taken for himself. And John says, nope, I want you to know it was Jesus who is Savior of the world. So he's making a direct, overt political claim about Jesus's kingship, which was, would have been seen and known by the original audience as a political statement. And so I like that song, because to me, I, I don't know, I know the politics of it, even if, even if the writer didn't, I know it. <laughs> That's really helpful. And I yeah. think uh, perhaps if our songwriters and worship leaders want to know a bit more about worship in the early church, as I recall, you do talk about that in your podcasts, don't you? So tell us where, how do we find those podcasts, Stephen? Well, I'm, I just launched a podcast called Tent Theology, the Tent Theology podcast, which I'm re-releasing the material. So I had done quite a lot where I, I, I recorded like a Bible study of the, the whole Gospel of Mark. Chapter by chapter, I've just done teaching, a political theology teaching through Mark, doing it through Acts as well. But I've decided in order to reach a better, a wider audience, I've, rather than host it on my own website, I'm turning it into a, a podcast platform. So right now, it's the best way to get it is as I release it on um, Tent Theology. 
tent theology. I need Apparently, to we, we started with looking at national. We're looking at nationalism and yes. patriotism right now, and that's just going to be for the next uh, few episodes, and then we're going to go into the Gospel of Mark. And in the context of that, you talk a bit about worship in the early church yeah, and absolutely. Um, yeah. Philippians, and I think that would be a yeah. great place for those that want to maybe dig a little bit deeper. Um, yeah. And we could spend all day going into that, but um, I have to say you're hitting us with a lot of <laughs> big and important things. So um, maybe just one last question. What would be your message to worship leaders and pastors as we start to rebuild our worship ministries and our gatherings again in this opportunity that we have potentially to reshape some things what would be your word of encouragement to us what would what should we be looking out for or thinking about well just remember i, I would say jesus is the measure of all goodness <laughs> um you know keep paying attention to his words and and it's not whether a thing works or not. We don't do something because it works. We don't do something because it's successful. If you're a follower of Jesus, you do it because Jesus asked you to, because Jesus said it was good. So, you know, just make sure that the measure of our success and our goodness is not bums on seats or record sales or political mm -hmm. party success or whether our legal rights are protected or not or whatever. It's you know, it's a, it's surprising how many people who call themselves followers of Jesus then are just open-handedly enthusiastic about aims and methods and people who are just, they show no awareness at all of anything that Jesus would have said or did. And in fact, they openly are against, against any of the things that Jesus said or did. So, you know, just calling yourself a Christian is, is pointless, really. Uh, it's, so, it's such a broad word, it almost doesn't make any sense. You can call yourself a Christian and support all sorts of things. You can't call yourself a follower of the way of Jesus and support all sorts of things. So I guess I would just want worship leaders to start really paying attention. Are they Christians or are they following the way of Jesus? And then to start using that as their measure of whether a thing is right or not, not whether the politician uses God language or not, because who cares? It's whether what they want and how they do it is in line with the way of Jesus. There's a lot for us to chew on in this <laughs> conversation. But the music has a part to play on that, right? You guys, you're musicians, you're helping to shape our imaginations. Mm -hmm. So talk about that for a minute. That would be, a, 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 that would be well, very inspiring. Good. Like it's, it's, you're helping us to celebrate what's good. Mm -hmm. so how do you, but how, so, all music, all be the best worship music celebrates what's good. All right. So then how do you define what's good? And this is where I would say is please, worship leaders, define what's good based on whether Jesus said it did it or not. Not based on whether it gets a room, a heart, the heart's pumping or it gets a room happy or like that's not the celebration of goodness. That's just a celebration of success. So I want to celebrate goodness gentleness kindness patience mm -hmm. self-control <laughs> right it's not a mystery this, you don't need a degree in theology <laughs> you just need to read the fruits of the spirit but those are the kind of things that i'd like to see worship leaders celebrate more right that is super helpful that is so so helpful and i love how the sermon on the mount is such a key part of of your conversation as well. And I think that really resonates with us in the vineyard anyway. And um, yeah. compassion, ministry, and justice are a big part of, of who we are um, a, as a movement overall. And I think as worship leaders, we can become a bit siloed in our little corner of, of worship music. And one of the opportunities in this season is to appreciate the wider body of Christ and um, many of our sanctuaries are turning into food warehouses and I just think that's beautiful yeah Jesus would love that exactly 
I think, yeah. I, I think that makes his heart really happy. Yes. So thank you so much, Stephen, thank for you. sharing your wisdom with us. And um, thank you for speaking into this moment that we find ourselves in. And we really just want to bless you as you continue to do that with grace and um, courage and um, endurance to keep running the race as well. So thank you so much for joining us and we will be having more conversations. Yeah, on I, hope worship. Just, I want to come back to Belfast and, uh, and see you all one day. That'd be great. That would be wonderful. I really hope that we can start flying and moving about again. Um, I have a little bit of cabin fever myself. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, thank you so much for tuning into this conversation, everyone, and have a really good rest of your day.